This is History 10. And we've come to a very interesting juncture. The juncture is that our person is antithetical to the state, which needs to be investigated for just a moment. It's easy to say the phrase person versus the state, or the state versus the person, or even to reduce the person down to the individual, saying that the individual has a problem with the state. And conversely, the state has a problem with the individual. In fact, it's only a regressive, culturally illusory tribal state that has problems with individuals. The state as a work of art has no problem with individuals whatsoever. And in fact, we need to perhaps revise the word that we use because state no longer connotates what it used to connotate when we say that the state as a work of art enjoys its individuals, flourishes for persons. The original term, lo stato, in Italiano, is something which Burkhardt points out meant the territory of the land and all of its people held together by the ruler, by the king. It isn't just that lo stato is a kingdom. A kingdom belongs to the king. But lo stato is a, a distribution of effectiveness, which means that not only the land, but the people themselves are part of a structure which is presented by the symbol of the ruler. The difference goes back to Roman times. And you would expect, if you thought for just a moment, because Italy is not only where Italians live, Italy is where Romans lived. And we have to remember that Rome was around for a very long time, from roughly 750 BC until at least almost 400 AD, and its effect and influence afterwards go right down to today. Even the epithet for Rome is that it's the eternal city. Not only has it always been there, not just 2,749 years, but it's always been there in the mind of divinity. And it always will be there, that Rome is an archetype. Rome. All roads lead to Rome. It isn't a phrase that comes because there was a pillar in a strategic part of the Roman Forum that was mile zero, though that was true. And all of the measurement of miles throughout the Roman Empire were in terms of that single post, that single pillar. So that if you were in Germany or you were in Parthia, the road measurement was in terms of that pillar in Rome in Italy. So you had to compute how far it was from two points in Germany in terms of their ratio to Rome. This quality of Roman mentality extended also to the state and made this archetypal form something that was not only expressed in Roman times, but has continued up to today. 
when Burkhardt writes in Judgments on History and Historians, he wrote, Rome, which had emerged from obscure Hellenic, Trojan, Italic beginnings, and they were very obscure originally. Rome was just a little collection of bands of fighting men. That was about it. Who had fled from the destruction of Troy. That's the myth. That's the epic myth of it. Rome was actually founded about 750 BC. The Trojan War was fought around 1200 BC. So what happened in the 450 years in between? But as Burkhardt writes, Rome had emerged from this obscurity and became, in her own phrase, notice that Rome personified itself. The Roman Empire was mistress of the Mediterranean. Rome is not a masculine being, but is a feminine being. So that the Roman emperor became someone who conceived that he and the state were the royal pair. And this has an insidious kind of equality. Here, Burkhart says, we have an example of a realized historical moment. Some kind of a juncture in time-space which is given a cinching energy of conscious ideation so that the idea lassos a focus of time-space and cinches it into a form which has its effect as long as the idea survives and that the idea has a protean kind of a quality. That is to say, it doesn't have to survive intact. Any part of the idea that survives carries the unconscious, or rather the subconscious impress of the whole idea with it. One gram of the idea of Rome carries the entire Roman Empire in it. And as we shall see, it's a radioactive element at this time. It's like plutonium. One little gram can kill the entire population of the planet. So that the detox is not a detox of just getting rid of the worst offenses. It's of understanding not to continue even one iota of a radioactive idea which in the last couple of thousand years has managed to kill a very large portion of the human race and is still actively infected with this disease. One of the things that we need to consider today is the fact that history as a process is a differential process, not an integral process. And Wide as is nature, vision is much wider than nature. The supernatural, the supranatural, is much larger. The differential vision is much larger than nature. And to that extent, history is much larger than myth. Myth is already an ocean. The mythic ocean as an integral process like nature. Both nature and myth, though they're very large, they're truly oceanic. Nevertheless, they are integral and they tend, like gravitation, to have form. They tend to have their items, their elements themselves come into form. Nature tends to come into form, into existence, into things. And language tends to come into form, into symbols, into ideas, into images. But vision and history are differential processes. And the process 
of history is the most differential process in reality. It means that language is better at integrating than nature, and it means that history is better at differentiating than vision. So that when you come to try to understand history, you have to be very circumspect and not be tricked into thinking that an idea of history <coughs> is what history is about. That history as a process, as a far-flung differential process, is so transcendently great compared to the idea of history. The idea of history is a symbol. It's an integral symbol, and it belongs way back there in the mind. Whereas history as a differential process is the ultimate speed of reality. One of the very best surrealistic paintings of the 20th century, done by the flamboyant Salvador Dali, had a Dali's taking of one of Raphael's great Renaissance paintings, and he called it the maximum speed of Raphael's Madonna. And there's this swirl of elements where he's atomized and put into a dynamic rotation. The Raphael painting stepped it up to maximum speed so that all of, my friend of mine coined uh, the word here, he called them anchor points. The pixels of a Renaissance painting are not the pixels of color, but they are the focuses of form. It's where lines uh, intersect and have junctures. And my friend Jan uh, Sather, who was a great painter in Norway, painting the portrait of the king of Norway, he called them anchor points. And he arrived at it by studying uh, the paintings of Rembrandt. And he found that Rembrandt in his Chiriosco, in his field of color, did not use pixels of color as the existential points for the form, but he used anchor points so that what counts is not so much the color as an element, but the color as a field of form. And when color is a field of form, it's differential and not integral. So instead of coming to focus, its reality is that it resonates indefinitely, which is why the experience of seeing a Rembrandt is quite extraordinarily different from a photograph of a Rembrandt. A photograph of a Rembrandt is an idea of a Rembrandt. The photograph itself is like a mental image that's put out. One has to transform that into art. An artistic photograph of Rembrandt is itself a work of art. And it's very difficult to photograph Rembrandt. But a very good artistic photograph of Rembrandt is not Rembrandt, but belongs to the photographer and should be held up as a work of art in its own right. The color registry of Rembrandt is very difficult to get if you're working with pixels. But if you're working with anchor points, you see that the composition, that the form, the structure, is a differential structure. That it doesn't come into a focus as an image, but it continuously has a harmonic as a work of art. The difference between a person and the idea of a person is monumental. A person is a differential form that has an infinite harmonic. That's why a person is spiritual. Whereas the idea of a person is a very powerful integral and has its place, but its place is in the mind, not in life. Life belongs to the living, not to the powerful ideation. 
And this is something which we have not only forgotten in our own time, but which has been forgotten because it was purposely programmed and inculcated in Roman times to make sure that no one got it right. Because the spiritual person who has an infinite harmonic is not factorable into the state as an ideational form. And we'll see that Burkhart makes a great deal out of this. Because while he's talking at the beginning of the civilization of the Renaissance in Italy, he's talking about the state as a work of art. And we'll take a look at those first two pages uh, before we leave today. <coughs> when you go to chapter 5, which is uh, in this edition of Burkhardt on page 382, he goes into the perfect man of society, the courtier. The courtier as described by the Renaissance writer Castiglione. The modern world remembers Machiavelli very well. And if you take political science anywhere in the world, you have to read The Prince by Machiavelli. But really, good humanistic education always included Castiglione's courtier along with Machiavelli's prince because the prince is about how to handle yourself in the state, whereas the courtier is about how to handle yourself in yourself. Nowhere do we find a Renaissance portrait of a person, especially of Machiavelli, that's anywhere near Raphael's portrait of the author of the courtier, Castiglione, and I'll bring a painting next, uh, a, a photograph of the painting next week. The perfect man, uh, according to Castiglione, the courtier, does not serve the state. He serves his own discipline of perfection and allows that to be utilized by the state up to a certain point. He says in here, it was for this society, or rather for its own sake, that the courtier, as described to us by Castiglione, educated himself. So that the whole process of the individual as a work of art is continuous education of oneself. Now this reflects on the very process that we're doing. We consider it a big difficulty to go through a two-year process like this education every Saturday for two years, 104 Saturdays in a row. What a great difficulty. What an impossibility. And in fact, in practical terms, it is. Almost no one does it. But the curious truth about the matter is that self-education is a lifelong process, and this is simply a show and tell on grade school level of a template which you can use in your own way. You don't have to do it on a weekly basis at some scheduled node of time space, but you can distribute that whole process that whole attentiveness, that the educational process can be distributed so you can do it at any moment, at any day, and then it becomes a yoga. Then it becomes something which you don't just do in a ritual comportment, but it's something which you are in a differential personal way. So this particular educational form is radically different from the educational forms anywhere on the planet, in any university, in any country. This form is made to melt away into your own personal discretion, your own personal distribution, as fast as you can do it, as fast as you actually do it. The form here is tied with a bow and not with a knot. <laughs> 
so that when you open up this education, you pull the bow and the bow opens and gives you the present. The present of the whole phase form technique, which is yours to do with as you see fit. But it's not something which can be commandeered ritually, nor something which can be commandeered ideationally on a mental level. Neither the body nor the mind are powerful enough to manipulate this kind of a form. It's only your person, your differential person, that is capable of utilizing this in any way in which you wish. And that's what it's for. So it has a time delay quality, not in terms of clock time or psychological time, but in terms of phase. It's like the phase of a liquid like water is that it will not turn to gas until you heat it to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you do heat it to that temperature, the water will boil and become vapor. Whereas its phase for freezing is 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and if you lower the temperature to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, liquid water will freeze and become ice. So when we speak that something is a matter of timing by phase, it means that when the conditions of reality are fulfilled, the next phase is there. You don't have to hope it's going to be there. It's a promise. That phase will be there right on time in terms of the development. And so it means that when your person is capable in a spiritual way, this whole educational process will open up to you and be completely malleable in every aspect. It's a yoga. It's been made to do that. But it's been made also to protect against premature ideation. We don't want to be fighting super informed uh, tyrants in the future. We don't want our children to have to deal with super savant tyrannies. And so this education is made to booby trap somebody who thinks that they can just take the idea of it and uh, club their way into supremacy. The same holds for the reductive thing of the cult of the body. No one respects the body more than someone who is spiritually alert. But there is such a thing in our time and has been for a long time and is also traceable back to the Renaissance. The body has a reductive place in a regression which is important. And so the body has to be not only integrated into a balance in terms of the integra integration, the integral cycle, but it needs to also be carried along with the transformation. It isn't just that the mind transforms, the body also transforms. So that the mind and body as a pair, as twins, as a tuning fork, transforms together. And the great idea of including gymnastics as a conscious part of education is a Renaissance ideal. Yes, it was taken from the classical Greeks, but disappeared from education in Roman times. The Romans specifically severed the mind and the body. And it was an educator named the historical name that it comes down to uh, by is Vic Victorino del Feltre. He lived from the late 1370s to the mid-1440s. And he was the great educator uh, in the Renaissance. His great education uh, took place with the Gonzaga of uh, Mantua. And but his book and his technique had a resonance all through uh, the Renaissance and on to on the present day. The whole idea that high school children or junior high school children have gym 
that Jim is a part of education comes from Victoria, who remembered that there was a reason why the Greek ideal was that the body and the mind together are a balance. And if anything is out of proportion, then there's a compensation that's going to be triggered. Either the body or the mind, like jealousy hidden in siblings, is going to come out one way or another. And so you have to portion it exactly. The difficulty which the Greeks had was that they saw it mainly as an idea of balance. as distinct from in India, where the same ideal was there, but was seen as a practice. The Indic civilization put the emphasis on the practice of it, the Greek on the theory of it. And very rarely do you find, only in a place like ancient Egypt, where the mind and the body were held in perfect equanimity not with the emphasis on the body from India. The yoga asanas are what you first learn in India. Whereas in Greece, it was the ideas about this that you learned first. But in Egypt, the ancient Egyptian, the African idea was always that they're in an equanimity so that one cannot tell where one leaves off with the other. And it's only there, in that equanimity, that the transformation is complete. This is why alchemy, as a function, was found originally in Egypt and not in India and not in Greece. Because alchemy is a transformation of the equanimity of mind and body into a conscious differential realm. So that an education that's realistic not only across the board, but in terms of the complete spherical reality, has this mind-body tandem. So that when the Roman Empire severed this, and severed it because of incredible hardships over about a seven century period, they severed it for reasons which seemed to them very good. But as Burkhardt points out, the Orient, which with its attempts at world monarchies, Greece with its colonial world, Carthage with its location and commerce, and the entire great barbaric West, were all fused into one. Rome fused. I used to use the phrase swallowed whole, everything, into one. They didn't chew it up. They swallowed it whole. Burkhart writes, then this whole, close to collapse, was entrusted to a world movement, Christianity under whose protective wing enough of it lives on to make possible a revival in the culture of the 14th to the 16th centuries. Since then, our horizon has been overshadowed by it. Rome is everywhere the conscious or tacit premise. Tacit means silent, but there. The conscious or tacit premise of our views and thought so that the whole ideational capacity, not only that the ideas are preconceived in terms of content, to a large extent they are, but the very structure by which ideas form is also preconceived. And when you add to that a preconceived image base, you realize that it's almost impossible for anyone to know that they're a prisoner. It is not possible to know because the normal basis upon which you could know by images, 
by ideas, by the process of forming new thoughts. All of these are co-opted, every single one of them, and expertly so. We need to understand a little bit. Burkhardt is pointing out to us that this was a very severe problem. It had its wondrous qualities, but it had its peril also. But we must remember that Burkhardt didn't live in the Renaissance. He lived in the 19th century. And he was writing about the middle of the 19th century. That's 150 years ago. Now we know, that is to say our species, Homo sapiens, sapiens, we know from a lot of investigation now that ideas have a lifetime. From the time that they are born in the insight of one person until they become the common language of people on the street is about 150 years. And so Burkhardt's idea, not only of a renaissance, but of an independent person, have come full, and they are now the current language on the streets of the world. So current is this language that in terms of a popular literature, I don't mean a fictive bestseller of one year, I mean over the last, say, 50 years, the most popular fictive novel about future history vis-a-vis -vis human beings is a science fiction novel written by Isaac Asimov called Foundation. So important is it that Foundation has been given several sequels by Asimov. He wrote finally a trilogy, the Foundation Trilogy, which he finished in the 1940s. And then he was beset upon by publishers and by readers around the world. And he wrote a second trilogy so that there were six foundation novels. And now in the 1990s, though, Isaac Asimov, Ike to his uh, uh, friends, because even though he is dead, his world of foundation is be being uh, continued. More novels are being written. And foundation, in poll after poll over 50 years, is always sized up as the greatest science fiction novel of all, the most influential. When, this is the first edition of the book publication of Foundation, 1951. The Psycho Historians is the very first uh, section. When you go to a magazine in which the story appeared. The cover has an illustration for an A.E. Van Vogt novel, uh, a short story, Asylum. And on page 38 of the May 1942 issue of Astounding Science Fiction is the original story of Foundation, of Asimov. And Asimov writes at the very beginning about a man named Harry Selden. Harry Selden, H-A-R-I. Harry Selden, born in the 11,998th year of the Galactic Era, died 12,069. The dates are more commonly given in terms of the current Foundation Era as 1 FE, 1 Foundation Era. So all time begins all calendrical, all historical computation. Born to middle-class parents on Helicon in the Arcturus sector, where his father, in a legend of doubtful antithesis, uh, authenticity, was a tobacco grower in the hydroponic plants of the planet. He early showed amazing ability in mathematics. Anecdotes concerning his ability are innumerable. Some are contradictory. At the age of two, he is said to have, and then there's an ellipse. Asimov just giving us little bits of quotations from the Encyclopedia Galactica, written who knows how many tens of thousands of years in the future. But his greatest contribution, Harry Selden, was in the field of psychohistory. 
Selden found the field little more than a set of vague axioms. He left it a profound statistical science. And then we have this biography of him, and the novel Foundation is about that. And Harry Selden realizes that there is a cycle to civilizations that takes place not over centuries, but over thousands of years. And that this cycle has such a amplitude, such a titanic tidal wave amplitude, that history runs in this energy field, and that everything is swept along with this energy field. And that no matter what you do, everything that you do is co-opted by time and space, but all time and space is also co-opted by the differential conscious process of history. So that the biggest energy in the universe is history. And of course, this is exactly what we find when we look at the Egyptian statement of the fact. Ra is not just the sun. Ra is the lord of millions of years. The Egyptian sense of time is extraordinarily different in scale. The Greeks thought in terms of generations and centuries. The Indians thought in times, in terms of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years, kalpas. But the Egyptians thought in terms of millions of years. It's a whole different scale. Whether one thinks in terms of tens or in terms of hundreds or thousands is quite minuscule when one thinks in terms of millions. And the Egyptian idea was that each day that Ra rises is a complete, independent, separate form that joins the unending line of forms of each day's going for millions of years. And that this is what history is. History is the ability for the individual spiritual person to free themselves from the constraints of time, space, and nature and to undergo a transformation where their individual harmonic joins the great harmonic of Ra. And so they are resurrected not just to a heaven which is someplace in space or a heaven which is someplace in time, but to the place of conscious time space which is infinite and is already millions of years. And that they are able then to visit any particular day in reality with body and mind intact so that one is freed from the constraints of time, one is freed from the constraints of space, both as limitations on life, both ways. One could visit the, the past, the present, the future at any time. The future which is being created one day at a time forever will be a new adventure a new day each day. But all of the past days for millions of years actually exist in history and can be visited, can be lived in, so that one has life eternal, not eternal from this moment on, but always and forever. The phrase sometimes in the Bodhisattva ideal in India, when this Egyptian idea through a uh, hermetic uh, quality entered into India and changed Buddhism to the Mahayana. The idea there was that as you become acclimated to eternity, eternity itself responds to you and becomes personal. That eternity which was a cosmic reality when it absorbs your personal, becomes in itself personal. 
And this, of course, is one of the great, um, not only ideals in uh, history and the planet, but becomes one of the most important of all historical processes. We find no trace of this in Rome whatsoever. The Roman idea of time, of space, of consciousness, of history, is a severely regressed and truncated quality. One of the peculiarities of this comes into this kind of a statement. This is something I wrote about um, 10, 12 years ago, Thoughts on History. It's in our, our pamphlet, our brochure. With a mythological horizon, one lives within the language forms. The language forms are not contiguous. Here the meaning is always content-oriented and feeling-toned. Psychic energy is a stream of conscious flow, a current mode, like an electric current. Interiorized meaning focuses into the symbolic vision. Here the forms of language are conscious and one is abstracted from the feeling tone content somewhat. If you deepen, deepen this integration, you lessen the feeling content. So that there is a quality that comes into play where one is more and more abstracted from feeling experience into a purity of ideation. This, of course, has both promise and peril at the very same time. The abstracting process can literally freeze dry you. Someone who is freeze dried in this way does not consider that emotional qualities of experience are structurally necessary. They are but content aspects. They are secondary to the forms. And so such a entity, whether it's a state or some kind of very powerful individual, will not consider that your feeling-toned experience is essential to the structure of your health, only that you get the ideas, the ideational forms that are good for you. One example of this in Roman times had to do with the fact that every male was eventually subject to constriction. He was constricted into the Roman military for a certain duration of time. His monetary independence was always his, but his duty to the state with his life was always the state's prerogative. It was a curious thing to us. The economic, monetary dimension of the individual was sacrosanct to the Romans. Your money was always yours. The state was always respectful of that. But your life belonged to the state. It's a very curious thing. We'll come back to this after the break. Uh, let me just pause here and refocus this so we can get back to this after the break. Asimov in the Foundation series saw that the cycle of life and death of civilizations over thousands of years was something that could not be stopped, but it could be transformed. As Asimov says, there was a time of the whole galactic empire of crumbling and that in normal historical process, it, was, it would take 30,000 years to bring it back. But he found a way to reduce the 30,000 years 
down to 1,000 years, that civilization can come back in 1,000 years by setting up a foundation, a seed structure of human beings, men and women, who would speed up the time of decay. But Harry Seldon, being a realist, saw that this foundation that would be able to do this could only do this by men and women who had an integral sense that was so powerful that they could make their ideas have an impress upon the forms of the natural cycle, upon the myths, upon the rituals, upon nature. But he saw that this was one-sided, that men and women who had this power would tend to simply use that power to cement their own position tyrannically. And so he set up a secret second foundation, unknown to the first foundation. Men and women who were completely unknown to these men and women at the opposite end of the galaxy, who specialized in sabotaging the very forms which the men and women of the foundation were expert at. And because they were exactly the unconscious of the conscious foundation, they would always be in a compensatorial tandem with them. Let's take a break. What we're generating here I used to call a field of inquiry. In the old-fashioned, reductive, flawed Roman way of educating, a subject would be carved out of reality, and it would be cropped by an appropriate frame of reference so that this subject would then fit in with all of the other subjects that were similarly cropped. And this became the repertoire of education that would be available to you. This subject matter would then be diced up into its grid-like forms, and they would time what the average feeding rate would be for this. And this was a course. And you would be given this kind of education, which is good for you. That entire process is flawed. Nothing in that process is true or real. None of it whatsoever. The net effect of that is to produce zombies. And we live on a planet today where the living dead are roving by the hundreds of millions. This is a very crucial problem. There are two different aspects which are paired, which undercut the entire problem. That is to say, they are not factors that are a part of the problem, but they are unraveling structural elements that were never co-opted into the pattern because they were never seen, nor had they been seen where they have been believed. The two points are the cosmos and the individual, the person. And the person, in a way, is exempt from the inculcating limitations, whether they are consciously impressed upon you or whether subconsciously you've been lured into it. If the individual learns to navigate in history, learns to navigate in history, that ship is free. That person is free. And you can literally go wherever you learn to sail. There are no constraints that are possible by the state 
or by any entity less than that. And I think we should include any entity more than that because there are metaphysical systems that constrain um, on a much more insidious and larger level than the state, although the state is always taken for the last 2,000 years as the sine qua non, as the, the focus of what the opposition is to the individual. Or to put it in our terms, the person as a differential work of art is diametrically opposed to the totalitarian state. One or the other has to go. They cannot exist together. They don't coexist at all. The more that the one comes into play, the more it shorts out the other. And this is a structural aspect. We live in a time where the powers of the totalitarian state are almost asymptotic. I just need to mention a couple. Genetic engineering, coupled with the control of the money supply, coupled with the control of technology, uh, just those three ingredients right there make it possible to have a kind of tyranny that the Romans would never have even been able to dream of. The fact is, though, that that entire enslaving context symbolized by the state is all illusion. It is only effective as long as someone believes it. So it's like the negative aspect of a fairy tale. Fairy tales are only true if you believe them. And political nightmares are only likewise true as long as you believe them. This is not to denigrate the millions of men and women who die at the hands of political tyrannies. Not at all. This is quite tragic and quite real. Their deaths are real. Their shattered lives are real. But the contextual entities that promulgate this are not real. They have no existence whatsoever. One of, the, one of the great archetypal images I saw of this in Canada about 30 years ago, there was an illustration of a knight on a horse with his visor down, he had a lance, and he was charging into a lion's mouth. <laughs> and I recognize this being an ancient Mahayana yogic ideal. Uh, it's, uh, in Mahayana Buddhism, it's called the lion's roar. Uh, the lion's roar of Queen Shmarala. And what it is is that terror yells at you, and as long as you cringe, you heard it. But when you go directly into its center, its larynx, it vanishes, and it vanishes actually without a trace. It doesn't leave any little soot particles anywhere in the micro universe, and so you know that it was complete illusion. It never was real. Its reality was a theft of your energy by forcing you to project out your reality, and it sucked it in and used that as some kind of a shell game vis-a-vis -vis you. You were the only source for its power. Now, in the 20th century, this particular tack was developed to the nth degree by Mahatma Gandhi. His position was that in a political war, one truth holder will defeat the entire world of evil. He called it satya graha, truth holding. And that there is such a thing as a satya grahi, who is like a Bhagavad Gita spirit warrior. And as long as there is one such warrior in the world, there is no possibility for a planetary tyranny to ever take hold. Because one satyagrahi holds the truth of withholding the projective energy that 
the nightmare needs to have for its existence. And as long as you do not let it co-opt your energy into its imagery, into its ideational structure, it cannot survive. And in face of a confrontation, a direct confrontation, there is no way that that particular projective power has any traction any further from that point on. One of the most incredible photographs in the modern world is the photograph of the young Chinese man in Tiananmen Square. This coat off, standing in front of a tank column, which stopped, and it stopped right there. And in a very peculiar way, this is like the fairy tale of our time. A real individual, that is to say a differential person, has a reality on a higher order of power than the state. And this is why individuals are feared by tyrannies. As long as there's one individual, that individual must be hunted down and gotten rid of. The fact that they have 250,975,452 under their power is not enough. As long as there's someone who is not co-opted, they are in jeopardy, and they know it on a very profound level. You must be found. The difference is, is that a conscious Bhagavad Gita spirit warrior not only understands that, but seeks to be found. <laughs> says in characteristic bar-fighting language, here's my chest, climb on. Because in that brawl, in that reality fight, in that spiritual judo, the state does not have a chance. It's almost shameful odds. Why is that so? We're looking at this specific situation today in this development of history. The development centers around our choice of a pair of texts, Hegel and Burkhardt. Burkhardt's Civilization of the Renaissance in Italy, Hegel's Lectures on World History. Now we need to do a little reconnoiter of Hegel for a moment. We need to go to his book, Lectures on the Philosophy of World History. On page 27, under general concept, Hegel is very clear about not being co-opted by powerful ideas, unlike many people who read Hegel and are bowled over by his powerful ideas. Hegel himself was not. And specifically when it comes to addressing the problems of history on a world scale, one has to be very clear on this point. Here's how he says it. The first thing I wish to say concerning our provisional concept of world history is this. As already remarked, the main objection leveled at philosophy is that it imports its own thoughts into history and considers the latter in light of the former. This is the popular kind of scam language which filters down to the street from authoritarian tyrannies that use very powerful ideational techniques techniques that are not made in the particular generation usually that are there, but are made hundreds if not thousands of years before and are still effectively there lingering on like radioactive plutonium. It is true that ideas which are brought into history are philosophic and it is true 
that history is so powerful it would dissolve ideas. Nevertheless, the idea that is brought in has a different characteristic when it gets into history. The idea, when it's in the mind, is an integral form, and it has an objective reality. Ideas are completely objective. They're as objective as things. The British philosopher Karl Popper once uh, wrote, he was very famous for a sort of a positivist outlook, he said, I, I believe in selves, that selves are real, are objectively real. Not only that the idea of the self is real, which it most certainly is, psychologically one can even test for the objectivity of the self. One of Jung's great ideas was the objective self. Hegel brings it a little clearer. As already remarked, the main objection, notice how we come back again. We lick the ice cream cone one more time to get the taste. We're doing it little by little because we want to have an accumulative penetration. Why? Why this technique? Because all of the direct lines are co-opted by illusory structures which work automatically. We don't have a chance. Why is it that the very first kindergarten principle of regaining your health in prayer or meditation is to quiet the mind? The monkey mind, why is that? Because the monkey mind jumps from radio station to radio station and all of that is pre-programmed Muzak. All of it. There's nothing on that bandwidth that is not already pre-programmed. And it has nothing to do with veneration of source. Oh, we, we can't throw that out. That was mother speaking. Out. We, oh, this was dad's favorite, sorry. Yeah, but our religion, forget it. Oh, this is the way people do, has no bearing whatsoever. The very first technique is to quiet the mind down. A, a jabbering, glib continuum of plaintive language is no prayer. And it isn't just that there is the quiet mind, the calm mind. It's that the body is so paired with the mind that as the mind quiets, the body quiets. And when they quiet together in an equilibrium, that equilibrium is like some kind of whole chord from which there is a kind of a music possible. That whole chord conveys to any ratioed distribution of its capacity the ability for sound then to have a harmonic and to carry a melodic line. In other words, once you have a chord, which is whole, any proportional divisions of it can be put together in relations, in relationalities, and that relationality can be a language of music, a harmonic and a melodic line, are both necessary for music. The same thing for the body and the mind. When they are in equilibrium together, when they are quieted together, they form like a chord, like a whole chord, out of which there is a differential music that is possible. So that the person, rather than being something, is actually like a musical composition. They're symphonic sometimes. 
spiritual persons sometimes are very symphonic, large, grand, unbelievable. Sometimes they're like a chamber music. Or sometimes they're like a jazz riff. There's a democracy to that that is uh, universal. There's room for everything. There's room for jazz riffs, and there's room for symphonies, choral symphonies, incredible compositions, small songs everywhere, every size. And if you can navigate, you can be any one of those kinds of compositions. Every single one of you can be a very interesting riff. Every single one of you can be a fantastic choral symphony or an interesting song. There's a lilt, there's a lyric, melodic line that is free when it has a harmonic contextuality to it. Let's come back to Hegel now. With this said, with this freshened up, we come back a third time. The first thing I wish to say concerning our provisional concept of world history is this. As already remarked, the main objection leveled at philosophy is that it imports its own thoughts into history and considers the latter in terms in light of the former. But the only thought which philosophy brings with it is the simple idea of reason. That's to say, on a really powerful, when your integration is really together, the only thought that carries over is the idea of reason, of rationality. Rationality not being that things are pre-programmed, pre-dried. That's a Roman stupidity. That's a kind of a co-opted absurdity. That ends up being entertainment for dead, even medieval monks who are arguing how many angels can dance on the head of the pin. That has nothing to do with anything. That's not rationality. The word comes from ratio. It comes from one to two, two to three, three to four, like that. Pythagorean musical ratios. It comes from the facts, fact that if you take, for instance, a simple Pythagorean triangle, the relationship of three to four to five forms a universal stability. And that if you look at that triangle in terms of the units, the little boxes, you could draw three boxes on one side, four boxes on another, and five boxes on another. And if you look at the triangle, the triangle has a volume. It has a volume of six boxes. It has a volume of exactly diagonally half of three times four, which is 12. It has a volume of six boxes. So that when one is dealing with the rationality of such a universal structure, you're dealing with a frame of reference which is actually three, four, five, six. Because the wholeness, the complete volume of the triangle is again a function of the reality of the entire progression. It's a part of the progression. It isn't just three, four, five, three, four, five, six. It's exactly the same thing as the I Ching, understanding that there are not just six trigrams, but there are eight. Two columns of four. And at the head of each of those two columns is the summation of the movement of the first three phases. The unbroken line has three possibilities in a trigram. It can be on the bottom, can be in the middle, can be on the top. But there's a fourth trigram, which is the abstraction of all three of those lines put together as a fourth. 
the trigram, which is yang completely. Nowhere in nature is yang complete. Yang is always in a context of yin in nature. But that fourth trigram where all three lines are yang and unbroken, that is real in a differential universe mode, not integral. And the same thing happens with the broken line. It can be on the bottom of the two, unbroken. It can be in the middle. It can be at the top. But the fourth trigram are the three yin lines together. But pure yin does not exist in nature. It doesn't exist in the integral mode at all, ever. Where is it real? Only in the differential, only in consciousness. But by adding that conscious fourth to the natural thirds, one gets a frame of reference which is real because it takes both aspects, the differential and the integral together, cinched together as a real form. That's why when you put then the pairing of any trigrams which are real together to form a hexagram, it translates not just as a symbol, but it's like mathematics. They are symbols which then touch and transform nature. The function of the I Ching as divination is grade school. That's nothing at all. That's nothing. Nothing. The fact that the I Ching is a navigating tool for a personal spaceship to go anywhere in cosmos that's real, that's something. All these textbooks about I Ching divination are like little manuals for first graders. That's not important. That was not even important 5,000 years ago on the other side of the world. What's important is the realization that with this kind of a compass, one is free to go anywhere you want to go and explore. Who cares? about divination of limited time-space focuses when one is free to explore conscious time-space resonances that are indefinitely infinite. is a completely different scale. But again, the only way in which the application is possible is to take it into its phase form completeness. You have to take all the phases together as an ecology. And it's only when one addresses the ecological completeness that the form that one is dealing with is the ecological phase form energy progression. Then one has a form which is real in the context of the infinite, as well as the finite. Then one is dealing with reality. And you can deal either way. You can deal with unboundedness or with anything bounded. Or in Pythagorean terms, you can deal with the limited and with the unlimited ambidextrously. Then you can navigate anywhere. Not that you can see to go in nature, and not just anywhere that you can imagine to go in myth, but in fact in reality. One has to constantly guard against thinking that the imagination is like some great huge ocean of some kind of improvement that, oh, well, we're imaginative, and that's like a good thing. It's full of peril as well as promise. The latest issue of Scientific American, September 1997, the truth about false memories. As long as you use imagination as the field, suggestion can come in and even recarve and reshape bits of memory that were real, and there's no way you can tell the difference. You remember very clearly things that never happened. 
powers on the level of thousands of years old states made by professionals at this sort of thing. Just because they were way back then doesn't mean they were naive. In many ways, they're much more sophisticated than the people around now. They programmed the keys to only type certain letters in certain sequences. And you thought you were a virtuoso. And what you're doing is that you're manipulating a limited set of building blocks. That's all they gave you. It's a large number when you go to list them. It's a very paltry vocabulary when you really get educated. You can't believe how clumsy it was to try and say anything meaningful with a language as truncated as that, with a syntax as butchered as that, with a grammar that has no transformational capacity whatsoever. It was left out. Whoa, left out, left out. So that you considered anything that was like beyond imagination, some kind of mystical, supernatural, who knows what. Or oh, it must have come from aliens. Or oh, it must have come from the gods. Oh yeah? That's a, that's a movie quote from James Cagney. Oh yeah? Aliens, huh? Gods? Yeah. Do you remember Judy Holliday? Ha! It's that kind of confrontation that's necessary for the differential spiritual person to put a stop to a flow process that constantly knots up and knots up in the two nodes where it objectively registers, in the mind and in the body. The tightness in the stomach, the constrictedness in the brain, in the mind. It's almost like having an aneurysm right there in the neural clouds. We know from physiological research that only when we pioneer new connections, new electrical synaptical adventures, uh, is the range of thought really enlarged. Otherwise, it atrophies. And it goes back to some kind of ritual selection. And the brain only allows electrical impulses, neural impulses, to be distributed in certain ways. This is a terrible disease. This is an Alzheimer's of the species. It's absolutely unacceptable. And in terms of individuals, it is crime because the individual has the only capacity that there is to change this, to transform this. No state could ever make a transformation. They don't transform. Because they are limited to functioning in the integral mode, and they do not function in the differential at all. No state ever does. But the famous I guess the most famous colloquial saying of all is the one of Jesus where somebody's talking about Caesar and God and he points to the shekel and he says, whose face is on the shekel? Caesar's. Well, then the shekel belongs to Caesar. He guarantees its value. <laughs> that, that money is his, his language that you're using to value your life actions. And that's as far as it goes. That's exactly as far as it goes. It has no bearing on your reality, nor on your potential for developing and growing and transforming a reality. None whatsoever. The limited 108 movements of Tai Chi Chuan were laughed at by Chuang Tzu 2,300 years ago. He says, are people Taoists because they imitate movements of birds and animals? That's a ritual comportment. 
that has nothing to do whatsoever with even level of the mind, much less level of spiritually differential person, much less differential cosmos. Let's come back to Hegel a fourth time and, and go all the way through it now. With our cumulative penetration, we're starting to be able to hear this kind of compact language in a way which becomes profound. He's talking about philosophic history of the world. He's writing it 170 years ago, but nothing has changed in terms of this issue, which is still front and center and right there. The first thing I wish to say concerning our provisional concept of world history is this. As already remarked, the main objection leveled at philosophy is that it imports its own thoughts into history and considers the latter in the light of the former. But the only thought which philosophy brings with it is the simple idea of reason. The idea that reason governs the world, ratios and that world history is therefore a rational process. World history, history, is a ratioed process. That is to say, it not only has a harmonic, which structurally you can learn, but it has a melodic line, which you yourself can be. Poetry is quite real, it differentially quite real poet much more real than the state. Plato was very circumspect when making forms of the state to leave poets out because you cannot inculcate a form of the state that includes poets philosophically because it just doesn't work they're always going to color outside the lines. They're always going to be doing something that is bad, and they're never going to behave. And they set an example for everyone else because they're the only ones that have any juice. And so the younger ones coming up, all they can do is lick each thing, and the only thing that has juice are these men and women who are not co-opted into the nice little forms of the state. So Hegel is writing this. He says the idea that reason governs the world and that world history is therefore a rational process, not a cut and dried process, a ratioed process capable of a harmonic, capable of accepting as real a melodic line which differentially also complements the harmonic from the point of view of history as such, this conviction and insight is a presupposition. Notice here that in the integral mode, the idea was completely powerful, that the world is rational, but now in the differential realm, in the differential mode, which is so vast and growing that the idea, large as it was in the mind before, is now but a presupposition in the flow of a process. And one has to be very conscious that as long as the idea is being used integrally as a symbolic structure in the mind, it's an idea. But when it's brought into play differentially in the historical process, it is a presupposition, no longer has its commanding place. Somebody who completely forgot that was Karl Marx. And communism was a 70-year nightmare for hundreds of millions of people and for billions of people around the world for making that kind of stupid tactical error. That comes from not really learning. That comes from reading books in the British Museum about philosophy rather than living it. 
Marx was a reporter for the uh, New York uh, Tribune, and uh, he did all of his reading and research in London in the reading room of the British uh, Museum, no, the British Library. And he got it wrong, chronically wrong. But it's very difficult when one is immersed in the historical nightmare of this kind of thing to be able to find, like a doctor of civilization, where did the infection come from? I remember talking to a, a man who cured an epidemic of hemorrhagic fever in Korea. Hemorrhagic fever in Korea was killing more than the enemy. And they couldn't find, because they didn't know the life cycle of the infection. And they had to isolate that first and understand it completely in order then to cure the disease. And it takes a while to do this, but it can be done. It's like our capacities are infinite, so that whatever problems there are to us are minuscule compared to our capacities. That once we are free to navigate in terms of history, all the problems of society and states, no matter how deep the complications, no matter even if they're unconscious or subconsciously inculcated, they are minuscule compared to our capacities. But the key to it, the key to it is education. Because education is the only process that carries over from the integral to the differential mode because it is the only process that accepts a transformation. But the education works with an energy that's very akin to love. So that one hears in traditional wisdom the the epithet, love is the only energy that goes throughout the entire universe intact and works. And love is at its deepest core a secret exchange of selves. So that not only do two become one, but two become eternal, which is deeper than one. Philo in Alexandria 2,000 years ago said um, the real is uh, deeper than the one. The one to be one must exist, but the real is before existence even happens. It's more profound. The secret exchange of selves is what love is all about. And education is this exchanging, not that somebody who knows chops up a subject matter and spoons it out according to schedule to you. I mean, that, in effect, enlarges your livers so that they burst and you become foie gras for somebody. <laughs> Let's not do that. We don't need to do that. But. How does the education work? For that, we go to our elusive educational pamphlet. And on the very last page, we see a phase form presentation of it. The teacher in teaching opens a channel. I'm not talking about channeling, just a concourse way. The teacher in teaching opens a channel. The teacher maintaining purity of self is only that openness and nothing else in itself, in himself. His self is openness focused. The student gives dedication. That dedication flows along the open channel towards the teachers. The teacher's open self receives that energy of dedication. Being openness the teacher's self is nothing in that it, quote, could hold on to that energy of dedication. Yet being focused openness, the teacher's no self returns that energy as his focused no self radiance 
back to the student. It's high dharma talk. The student receives is redeemed by that radiant energy of the teacher's no self. Indeed, it is his own energy reformed as the focused openness of the teacher. In that radiant receiving, at that same instant, as giving energy of dedication, the student experiences the transformation of focused openness in himself. For the focused openness absorbs all illusion, and the radiance enlightens all ignorance. The teacher and student are consonant in a shared presence. Now together they constitute the archetype of wisdom education, teaching learning in consonants. This had many names. Uh, Kingdom of God, Body of Truth, Dharmakaya, all of it inv invisible to the profane. Not only do they not see it, they can't imagine it. Because it's not imaginable. But it is memorable. This kind of secret exchange of sounds, which is characteristic of love, is characteristic of the educational process. And that's why the educational process works even though it undergoes the transformation. What doesn't undergo transformation very well are ideas that are not integrated very well. Ideas that are not integrated have this kind of stuck quality. It's like if there was a sieve of transformation. It isn't that the particles are too big to go through the sieve of transformation, it's that they're glue and they stick up so that the very transforming sieve becomes clogged. So that not only does this not transform, but the whole capacity to transform anything becomes mucked up. And as that goes on, it becomes emotionally certain that there is no transformation possible. This is the little death of which there is. It's the only death that there is. Not only is one emotionally certain that this is so, but one's imagination becomes inculcated by this structural process of glued up and bouncing off that glued up capacity so that one begins to uh, remember quite clearly that you know not only is this not possible with certainty emotionally, but you can remember that this was always an illusion on people's parts who claimed that it was so. And you become certain of this, and you remember it. This is where the state comes in with its speciality. It offers a way to live in view of these brutal but necessary limitations. You've wised up, you've matured, you've become adult, which we have learned in our time means that now you can read pornography. <laughs> and that's about the level it is. This kind of education shows that that transformational capacity in no way was ever a sieve that could be glued up. That there is nothing that carries that kind of capacity into that kind of a vehicle whatsoever. But that the transformational node itself has a zero designation. Here's a quotation from our friend Burkhardt. The precondition of developed history is, of course, the existing state, for all history is the history of states. 
but the state is already in itself a historical movement towards freedom, which is never present absolutely, but only as the act of liberation. Now this is a very convoluted way of making three fundamental errors at the same time. Uh, next week we'll go into it in more depth. The three fundamental errors are this. And when one talks about freedom, freedom is always a differential ideal. It's not some kind of ideal that belongs in integration. The only thing that you can integrate is the idea of freedom, not freedom. To, to think that an act of liberation is liberating is to misconceive a ritual comportment, ritual actions, which are confused with actual historical processes which are not about acts, but are about actors acting. <laughs> and three, the most fundamental of all, the statement which is never present absolutely, that there's no absolute ever present is completely erroneous. Just because zero doesn't exist like one or negative one doesn't mean that zero doesn't happen. Not only does it happen, but its formation of place structures in the invisible is one of the most common assumptions of all mathematics. Every child who's adding up a series of numbers that goes over nine knows that you have to carry a number over. The carrying over into another order is a child's way of recognizing the potent power, the order-making capacity of zero place. It's as simple as that. It's as complex as that. How is it that such sophisticated persons, such as a Burkhardt or a Hegel, can also carry erroneous, powerful erroneous ideations and misunderstandings in the very cream of some of the best writing. This is where compassion has to come in. Human beings have been subjected to such a brutality in their history over the last five, six thousand years that one has to forgive everything. Everything on every scale the nightmare has been more unbelievable than anyone could have supposed. Toynbee, in his great study of history, did an investigation, especially on Rome, because it was a sticking point. He found that there was an event, one event among many, this event he wrote 1,400 pages on. It's called Hannibal's Legacy published by Oxford University Press. Almost nobody has ever read it. If you take the time to read it, I read it because I was with Toynbee in San Francisco for a week one time when he was recording at uh, KQED, uh, public television. I got to talking about Rome, got to talking about where the knot was tied in the Roman psyche. And he said, it's in my volumes on Hannibal's legacy. The Roman Empire is Hannibal's legacy. Before Hannibal, the Roman people were very democratic. They were based on the land. They were based on blunt, open honesty. They were based upon an idea of kinship and kingship, which both had what the Romans in ancient times called gravitas, that there was a sober respect for the reality of other people and of themselves and of the forms that were made to make life possible. Hannibal was a Carthaginian general, unbelievable strategist, brutal. He roamed 
with his army, his army which included elephants and fantastic cavalry and tough troops, infantry, he roamed for 17 years up and down the Italian peninsula, killing people at his whim. He could never quite take Rome, but they could never quite get rid of him. And so a whole generation of Roman boys and girls grew up to be Roman men and women with this constant fear. And when they had a chance, when they found a general who was as good as Hannibal, uh, his name was Scipio Africanus, he was one of the greatest generals in world history. Scipio Africanus, when he defeated Hannibal and went over to Carthage and defeated the Carthaginians on their home turf also, the Roman people almost unanimously, unanimously voted to destroy the Carthaginians completely forever off the face of history, off the face of the planet. From this generation of supercharged fearfulness came a brutality that became characteristic of the Roman Empire because they not only defeated the Carthaginians, they killed them all. And then they destroyed their city. They destroyed Carthage down to where they pried up the foundation stones and poisoned the earth so that where Carthage was is today a salt swamp where nothing grows still. It's this kind of brutality that the Cold War bred for two generations of human beings on the planet. And so we have this kind of equality. I know we're running over. We're run over. It's important to understand that we all grew up in a situation that was so brutalized on top of a parfait of brutality and illusion and deception that is complete wonder that we have any kind of generosity or capacity for love at all. And that we do is like proof positive that it's not co-optable and it's not killable. That anybody is here at all. One looks around and says, well, there are so few. How can it be important? Or how could it possibly be true? But the fact is, is that there is anyone here at all, is the miracle, is the beauty of it. It's just a matter of exposure, or something like this becomes worldwide. The fact that anybody arrives here at all on their own individual recognizance, despite the fact that there's no fame, there's no name, there's no profit in it, and that you do this is like the greatest joy possible. It means reality is alive and well in human persons who are free in the cosmos. And that as you can learn to exercise your freedom, learn to enjoy your variety, all of it is real. More next week.